were especially fortunate now to have one of the leading experts on smallpox and the person who was instrumental in the eradication efforts with us today. Dr. D.A. Henderson is now the director of the Center for Civilian Biodefense Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, Dr. Henderson. Very happy to be here. Uh, the first one confused me last year since smallpox has been eradicated, but I guess things aren't always as they seem. You're right, Doris. You know, smallpox was eradicated uh, by the World Health Organization. Uh, the last naturally occurring case of smallpox uh, occurred in Somalia in 1977. In fact, smallpox represents probably the greatest public health success story uh, in the history of public health. Uh, it is the first and heretofore only eradicated disease. Uh, and we now, this year, celebrate the 21st anniversary of the global eradication of smallpox. In 1978, there was an additional laboratory case or two uh, in Britain. And in 1980, the World Health Organization formally declared smallpox eradicated. I wonder now if, Dr. Henderson, you could give us a description of that, uh, that eradication uh, campaign. Right, in 1966, uh, the people at the World Health Assembly uh, discussed the question of undertaking uh, an eradication program. And uh, it was finally decided that we would, and uh, they allocated some $2.4 million for the effort per year. The strategy as we began the program was twofold. One was to vaccinate 80% uh, of the population in each of the endemic areas and the neighboring countries with the thought that this would markedly reduce the incidence of smallpox so that we would then be able to move on with our second phase of the program which would be reporting surveillance to find the cases and then containment. Briefly that you would set up in it for each hospital and health center a report reporting system so they report every week whether they say saw, saw smallpox or not and then there'd be a team go out and if they had smallpox then they would vaccinate in that household and in the village and uh, thereby stop the spread of smallpox because it spreads as a continual chain. Each individual is going to infect another individual and every two weeks you have a new case. And every individual who develops smallpox has the typical disease. It's not like polio or other diseases. We have many atypical cases. Every case is a person with rash and fever and all of the other uh, symptoms. So it was very easy for us to identify a case and then contain it and stop the spread of these chains. Uh, a 10-year ten, target was set to, to complete the task. We missed the target by uh, uh, some 26, uh, seven, seven, eight months and 26 days. So uh, at any rate, the last case, as you say, occurred in 1977 in Somalia. And since then, there's been no smallpox anywhere in the world. Now, as far as I've been led to believe, there are two recognized repositories of smallpox or variola virus in the world, at the Centers for Disease Control uh, in this country and at the Institute for Virology and Bio Biotechnology uh, at Koltsovo in Russia. Is that your take on this? Well, certainly uh, from the, the World Health Organization, when I was there and those who followed me, we worked very hard to try to get the smallpox in as few places as possible so that there'd be the least possible risk of spread of uh, that virus getting loose again and really causing trouble. And I would say up until probably three, four years ago, uh, we were pretty persuaded that this was the case. Now, on the basis of people who've defected from Russia, we uh, understand there are probably two, maybe three more sites in Russia. We also have the problem in Russia, as we all know, of uh, chemists and physicists leaving the country to go elsewhere. Biologists have done the same. Are there possibly sites in other countries that may have the virus? We don't know, but you can speculate. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, at this point, Ted, why don't we talk more about the smallpox virus? Okay, uh, Doris, the smallpox is caused by the variola virus, and the <laughs> variola virus was responsible for millions of deaths. Uh, one of the great diseases of antiquity, again, just like anthrax and plague. Responsible for, again, millions of deaths uh, dating from before the 12th century B.C., as far as we know. The Egyptian pharaoh Ramses V uh, probably died from smallpox, and that theory is based on examination of his uh, mummified remains. Uh, after smallpox was introduced to the New World, uh, it's estimated that at least three and a half million Aztec Indians uh, died uh, of the smallpox. Well, in fact, uh, Ted, it, I think it's been even more severe a problem to the Indians than that. And many people don't realize this, but as we've gotten back in the history, we began to realize that the death rates among Indians 
may have been as high as 75 to 90 percent. Mm. Uh, a really remarkable uh, number of deaths, and we have many accounts of whole Indian tribes being wiped out within a period of really a couple of years. There were so few people left that they couldn't sustain themselves and they died out. So that in fact, when the pilgrims landed in North America, they had very little difficulty with the Indians. But what's not talked about is the fact that this was only two years after a major epidemic wiped out huge numbers of Indians mm -hmm. along the eastern co uh, seaboard and uh, permitting the pilgrims to settle peacefully. Mm. You know, Doris, I think there's the perception out there amongst a lot of people still that biological warfare is something very new, product of a brave new evil world, mm -hmm. if you will. And I think we showed yesterday that, in fact, uh, that's far from the truth. In 1346, against, again, the plague was right. used uh, against Kaffa. Well, I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, even in the United States, biological warfare is nothing new. It dates back a couple of hundred years. Uh, during the French and Indian Wars, Sir Geoffrey Amherst of the British uh, Army uh, was tasked with capturing Fort Carillion. Now known as Fort Ticonderoga uh, from its Indian defenders. And he hit upon the idea uh, of taking the scabs of smallpox victims, grinding these scabs up and placing that uh, infectious powder uh, into blankets and then passing the blankets off as uh, gifts to the Indians. And in fact, uh, this unfortunately worked as well. The Indian defenders uh, of Ticonderoga succumbed to the smallpox. Isn't this uh, what you call the gift that keeps on giving? That's right, one of the <laughs> gifts that keeps on giving. Right. And uh, Dr. Henderson, I think, probably can uh, tell us some more terrifying stories concerning smallpox you may have learned from Dr. Alabeck. <laughs> right. I think uh, from that time, uh, the French and Indian Wars until now, we've uh, until very recently, certainly there's been no thought, thought or threat of uh, smallpox being used in this way. And in fact, in large part, I think it's because we've had so much vaccine that's been available and people have been vaccinated around the world. But uh, Ken Alabeck, who uh, was the number two man in the... Russian bioweapons uh, production uh, setup uh, tells us an interesting story that in 1980, just as we decided, uh, as the World Health Assembly pronounced that smallpox had been eradicated and advised that everyone stop now for vaccinating, which they did, uh, he, they saw this and the Soviet Union as an opportunity. And with this, they developed a very large production plant for smallpox virus. As he tells me, the plant, one plant, has a capacity of producing 100 tons of mm. smallpox virus per year. And uh, this is still extant, developed since 1980, and a large-scale production facility. So this is something that is really very much of concern at this point in time with all of the troubles in Russia uh, right now. Right. Well, smallpox, I guess, can be an even greater th uh, threat than some of the other agents because it can be transmitted person to person, correct? Yes, it can. And I think the, the two major diseases which can be transmitted uh, person to person are plague and smallpox. But actually, smallpox is much easier to transmit than plague. And so I think in my judgment, I would rate smallpox right at the very top of the list as the w most severe, most serious of the problems that we face. You know, Doris, I just want to reemphasize something we said yesterday. Uh, from a military perspective, one of the main tenets that a battlefield commander wants to in adhere to is to maintain control of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. uh, so a disease such as smallpox, uh, if a commander unleashes that disease, uh, he, it does its dirty work, but then it affects the civilian population uh, and continues to propagate, and the battlefield commander, in essence, loses control of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. from, so from the perspective of a military weapon, perhaps smallpox isn't quite as attractive, but to the terrorist who doesn't care what he unleashes mm -hmm. on humanity, this may be, uh, in some sense, the ideal weapon. Right. Um, how does the virus cause the disease? Well, uh, following an asymptomatic uh, incubation period uh, of about 12 days, actually ranges from 7 to 17 days, but uh, you can almost set your watch by this 12-day average. Uh, following that 12 days, there's then an infection that develops in the respiratory mucosa. Uh, proliferating virus particles uh, circulate around uh, the lymphatic system uh, to the regional lymphatics. Uh, from there, a minor viremia ensues, and virus spreads to the liver, the spleen, uh, the lungs, the bone marrow. Uh, once that happens, the prodromal symptomatology starts. You get two to three days worth of uh, uh, fever, nausea, malaise, the I don't feel goods. Uh, during that time, a major viremia ensues, uh, seeds the skin, and following that, the characteristic exanthem that most of us would know smallpox by uh, develops. Okay. Well, as well as Dr. Henderson, Dr. Don Hopkins, a former deputy director at the CDC, 
was also someone closely involved with the smallpox eradication efforts in the 70s in India and Sierra Leone. So let's listen to him describe cases of smallpox that he'd treated. It was a, uh, a, a really sad thing to see when uh, you knew somebody had smallpox or they were just coming down with it because you and they knew that uh, it was between them and God as to what the outcome would be. Uh, people felt very ill. Uh, this, this, this virus is said to make people feel as though their skin were on fire. Uh, even before the rash begins, they have headache, backache, and felt generally flu-like symptoms, felt uh, miserable already, a virile or major. Uh, this. Uh, as the virus progresses, people uh, would get these severe rashes on their skin. The same thing often was happening in their throat and in their intestines. And so you have people who are uh, turned into uh, monsters before their eyes, before the eyes of their, uh, of their family and uh, who often died. Uh, some of them who got uh, hemorrhagic smallpox were, uh, were transformed uh, even more. They were just bleeding from all of their uh, orifices. Most people apparently uh, died just because of uh, overwhelming uh, viremia, but also with uh, severe diarrhea, just as their skin could be seeing to, uh, to, to, to desquamate. Uh, internally, sometimes uh, people would be uh, losing the entire lining of their uh, bowel or having uh, fluids to ooze into their, uh, into their lungs. Sometimes the virus would attract, would uh, attack uh, vital places such as the heart directly, for example. And uh, as infection wore on, sometimes uh, people would get secondary infections of the open wounds on, on their skin. But sometimes with very severe rashes, people would just slough great chunks of their uh, skin, which would then be uh, opened just as if they had been burned to uh, secondary infection. There was also a peculiar stench associated with all of this decaying flesh on a living, uh, on a living uh, person. And so to go into a village where you had uh, several people like this and other villagers terrified, some of them unimmunized, was a very, uh, it was a very sad thing uh, to see. Knowing also that you had nothing to offer a person other than palliative kind of things, really, when they uh, had progressed to the state of already having the rash. You know, Doris, as a pediatrician, I think you could see uh, it would be easy to confuse this disease initially uh, with chickenpox. And in fact, that's the primary disease in the differential diagnosis of smallpox. Uh, not too many other things that would look like this. So uh, initially, on the first day or two or maybe three uh, of the exanthem, uh, it would certainly be very easy to confuse it. I think it would be easy uh, to confuse a case of smallpox with a case of chickenpox. Once the disease progresses, though, and you get to the point you saw in some of these pictures, I think you could see it's pretty easy. This is a no-brainer diagnosis, mm -hmm. essentially. And I guarantee that after you've seen a case or two, you'll never forget it. It won't be too tough to make the diagnosis thereafter. Uh, Ted, I think you're absolutely right on that. And uh, I'd say 90% of the cases uh, turn out to be very typical, but not at the beginning. It gets to be a, it's a little bit difficult right at the beginning. And I think uh, perhaps we can see a succession of pictures here which may uh, portray this. The individual, once he was infected with the disease, would have a very high fever, uh, would feel aching pains in the back and, uh, and, and headache. He'd have uh, nausea, maybe vomiting, may even have enough of intestinal pain that he might uh, look like an acute abdomen. And this goes for two to four days, normally. And the individual usually goes to bed. He's feeling really rather miserable. Then the rash begins. Now we have, here we have day two. You just see uh, small macula, vesicular macular lesions coming up. And we go on to uh, look at uh, subsequent days. You'll see this is the same child uh, day by day. This is, I should note, uh, what we call an ordinary case of smallpox. It's not a serious case. Day four, you can see it's becoming a little more apparent, and uh, you will note that the, the lesions, if you look at those on the face, you'll see them all at the same stage of development. They're all kind of pustular. If that were the case of chicken pox, you would see scabs and pustules and little macules all in the same area. But here you see all those lesions are the same. Now we're up to day seven. Uh, we move on to... Uh, what do we have? Day nine next, day eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the 
patient is feeling very miserable indeed, and uh, he has most of the lesions are going to be on the face, on the arms, on the legs. There will be some on the trunk, but not as many, and we call that a centrifugal distribution. Uh, it's in contrast to chicken pox, in which there are more lesions on the trunk and many fewer on the face, arms, and legs. Why this is so, we have no idea. We go on to the uh, next uh, slide. Now, this shows a foot and a hand. Now, you'll see the pustules on the palms of the hand there, and similarly in the soles of the foot. Uh, this is also classically smallpox. You'd rarely see those lesions in chicken pox on the palms and soles. Now, let us move on to the next uh, well, now you'll see scabs are beginning to form, uh, and uh, some of them you'll see on the upper chest, they're beginning to fall off. They leave depigmented areas for a period of time. Uh, we go on to uh, the next. Now we're up to day 20. Now most of the scabs have separated, and the individual will have on the, on the face, wherever one of those pustules is present, there will be a scar, so that the individual will be really quite extensively scarred. So as we think about it, the difference between smallpox and chickenpox, and chickenpox is the one disease that really was confused most often with smallpox. With chickenpox, you have the centrif uh, smallpox, you have the centrifugal uh, distribution, and in chickenpox, centripetal. You have the lesions appearing in, the, in any one area are all the same with smallpox. And thirdly, you will see them on the palms and soles. And with that, you shouldn't have any difficulty in uh, diagnosing it. Mm. This is a truly horrible disease. I mean, does everybody have the same type of symptoms? Well, Doris, as uh, Dr. Henderson alluded to, about 90% of patients would be expected to develop what you just saw here, variola major. There are variants of the disease, however. Um, again, that child you saw was variola major, but variola minor, uh, and I think we have a slide of that. Uh, this woman here, uh, this Ethiopian woman, you can see doesn't really look that sick, and in fact, she's still able to get out and about, go about her daily chores, take care of her family, uh, despite having this variola minor disease. Variola minor uh, features milder systemic toxicity, smaller pox lesions. Uh, it has a much lower mortality rate, 1% uh, in unvaccinated uh, victims versus the 20 to 40 percent that we would have seen uh, with variola major. But Ted, what determines whether you get major or minor? Well, uh, I think Dr. Henderson might be better able to talk about that, probably strain differences uh, amongst viral strains. There were two major, uh, two differences, two types of virus. One was a variola major, which caused a severe disease, and that's what we saw throughout all of Asia and a lot of Africa. The other disease was variola minor, which only caused 1% death rate, and we saw that in Ethiopia. We saw it in Southern Africa, and we saw it in Latin America. So that I think if we were worried about this as a bioterrorist agent, we would be looking at variola major mm. as being the one that would be uh, used. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about any of the other variants, uh, flat-type smallpox, right. hemorrhagic smallpox. Right. Uh, I think in uh, Dr. Uh, Hopkins' uh, pictures there, there were a couple of uh, patients that uh, had the, the uh, hemorrhagic form. These are particularly of concern. The individual comes down with this sort of disease with all the hemorrhaging, and it's very atypical. There's no real rash as such. And so that uh, you're ap very apt to miss this diagnosis entirely. When we've had these cases admitted to hospital, they are, uh, pose a, a special problem because they excrete a lot of virus. They expose patients, they expose staff. And in a bioterrorist attack, these are cases that are likely to get into the hospital before the diagnosis is made mm -hmm. because they have a shorter incubation period as well. So that the ones, the f hemorrhagic cases and what we call the flat cases, which the skin just sort of uh, forms a velvety kind of swollen texture, uh, are very difficult to uh, diagnose indeed. Well, it seems the clinical picture is very diagnostic of smallpox. Is there any other way to diagnose the disease? Well, in the laboratory, I think there's a very straightforward way to get a diagnosis very quickly, and that's to take a little of the pustular flu fluid or a little material from a scab, and you put it under uh, the microscope, an electron microscope, and you will see a picture, there it is, of this uh, very characteristic kind of brick-shaped organism. Now, you can't tell whether that is smallpox or vaccin vaccinia, the vaccine virus, or cowpox or monkeypox, 
But if you're seeing that patient as sick as that, you know it isn't cowpox, you know it isn't vaccinia, and unless you're in Africa, it's not going to be monkeypox. So that's smallpox. Okay. Now, smallpox is contagious. Does that mean that anyone who comes in contact with a smallpox patient will get the disease? Well, Doris, when smallpox roamed the earth, about 30% of non-immune uh, people who came in close contact with a victim would be expected to develop the disease. Um, that incidence would increase in places with a low relative humidity, uh, as was seen in parts of okay, Africa right. where this disease uh, held on the longest, I guess. Um, it's difficult, though, in the individual case to decide who's going to become infected and who isn't. And Dr. Hopkins, I think, has had extensive experience with exactly uh, that question. Okay, well, why don't we take another look at Dr. Hopkins describing his experience with the infectivity of smallpox. In, uh, in, in some instances, you, you really couldn't predict this virus. I recall uh, very much an instance in which we had an explosion of smallpox around a prominent man who had died of smallpox. Both of his wives had been infected, and uh, in fact, one of them gave birth just before her rash appeared. When I arrived in the village, this baby had uh, lain on the floor of this mud hut between the mother and the mother's co-wife, both of whom had severe smallpox rashes. The baby was about a week old and had not been infected. I vaccinated that baby uh, that day and came back a week later to see a very nice vaccination uh, scar. And I visited that village several times. The baby survived. I still uh, do not know or understand why that child was not infected because in fact, pregnancy put women at much greater risk of dying of, of, uh, of smallpox and the, the fetus was also uh, at risk because under those circumstances pressed immunity, the fetus and the mother often got severe smallpox and would die. But that child, uh, as best one could tell, didn't even get uh, infected. In other instances, there were situations where people did not even know they had been exposed to smallpox. They either had encountered somebody who was in the prodrome and didn't yet have a rash, or they simply didn't know that somebody uh, had a rash. They didn't, they didn't notice. But one of the advantages about this disease was that people who were infectious to others generally, unless they were in, in the end stages of the incubation disease, they had a rash, and not only that, they had a rash on their face, so you generally would know it. But sometimes, every now and then, one would encounter people who didn't know how they had been infected or, uh, or by whom. And in, in, in those instances, uh, it was uh, airborne from somebody uh, that, that they, didn't, they didn't even see the rash. Oh. Well, once you've been exposed, is there anything you can do to prevent the disease from occurring? Well, I think you can prevent the disease if you're vaccinated beforehand. And it would appear that if one were to vaccinate someone within, say, the first three, four, or five days, you might prevent death from the disease. Now, at one time, we had uh, vaccination was worldwide. And in this country, every child was required to have vaccine by school entry. So that we were a very well vaccinated population, but most of the rest of the world was too. Then in 1980, with the declaration that eradication had been achieved, the decision was made to stop vaccination. It was a wise move because the vaccine is not without some risk. Now uh, we've had no vaccine used in the U.S. for probably 25 years. So we have a very large susceptible population. As far as vaccine is concerned, we now have probably enough to vaccinate five, six, seven million people in storage at this point in time. But we have no vaccine manufacturing capacity any, mm -hmm. anymore in this country. And indeed, we don't have any in the rest of the world. So that is as much vaccine as we have right at the moment, something we're going to have to be very careful about using. Do members of the military still get vaccinated? Well, Doris, uh, the general public uh, stopped getting vaccinated in 1972 in this country. Uh, for a while after that, the military continued to vaccinate. Then they stopped. A few units started up again. There were some uh, minor service-specific differences. But basically, uh, sometime in the 80s, the military stopped vaccinating as well. And I think it's safe to say uh, that probably virtually no one under the age of 25 right now in the United States has been vaccinated. Well, I'm just slightly over the age of that, and uh, I was lucky enough to get vaccinated <laughs> as a child, so I'm safe, right? Well, I don't know. Right? Well, I wish I could say yes. 
But uh, we, now, we know that uh, the vaccine given once is not going to be fully protective. Uh, and it was learned very early that revaccination was going to be necessary. So um, I'm not sure that uh, you or anybody else at this point who's vaccinated 25 years ago is going to be protected against the disease. Dr. Henderson, I, you know, I was vaccinated in childhood. If, God forbid, uh, I ever came in contact with smallpox, could I at least expect to get a milder case of disease? I think some of the people would get a somewhat milder case and might not, <coughs> excuse me, might not die as a result of uh, the, the infection, which would be, I think, fairly important. But uh, indeed, after 25 years, we have the feeling it's not going to be a lot of protection that you will have. We're in the same boat together. All right. All right. Now, if I get exposed to smallpox and I've never been immunized or it's been a long time, what do I do next? Well, Doris, one of the first things you should consider is to get vaccinated. Uh, again, the vaccine is licensed. It's very effective. That's not to say uh, that civilian practitioners would have access to it necessarily, yeah. but in a national emergency uh, like a smallpox exposure, hopefully uh, we would be able to procure vi a vaccine and give to you. So uh, you'd want to consider getting vaccinated. The vaccine uh, is effective. Uh, we know that uh, from the eradication campaign uh, in Africa. It's administered by intradermal uh, inoculation with a bifurcated needle, uh, a process that became known as scarification because of the permanent scar that resulted. And in fact, we uh, believe that if you didn't get a scar, you didn't have an adequate vaccine right. take. So that thing that's uh, right there on the arm, that's it? Right, that's so, it. Uh, the scabbing and the scarring show that you have right. had a, a good clinical take. So for a while, at least uh, in the past, you were protected. Uh, if you didn't have that, uh, again, that's an indication that the vaccine you had been given might not uh, have been effective. If you get revaccinated, however, uh, you might not develop a scar the second time around. You usually do develop a vesicle uh, five to seven days post inoculation. Uh, you get some surrounding erythema and induration of that vesicle. A lesion uh, forms, it scabs over, and it gradually heals uh, over the next one to two weeks. That would be the way we would normally expect it to play out. Now, Dr. Henderson, you said the vaccine is not without some risk. What are some of the other side effects besides the scarring? Well, there are several. Not let me mention those in for just a moment, but I think it would be useful to look at a picture of a, uh, a normal vaccination because it's uh, very few people have seen this in this day and age, and uh, it, uh, you can see it looks uh, somewhat ugly. Uh, there's this mm -hmm. pustular lesion in the center. You'll see uh, some erythema around there. It's redness uh, out there for quite a distance. The individual may have some fever. He may have some lymphadenopathy associated with this. And this is just a normal reaction. I think there are many who look at that and say, well, there might, maybe there's some bacterial infection there and maybe we ought to do something about it. But in fact, this is not bacterial superinfection. This is just the normal reaction that one may have. Now, if we can see a couple of other uh, reactions, uh, I think we have some that we can show here. Here you see a number of lesions around the main lesion. Uh, that may come about as a result of the individual scratching the uh, lesion and spreading it around that area. When you get that kind of spread, it's nothing to worry about. In fact, all, each of these lesions will basically go through an evolution as though they'd all been inoculated at the same time. So it's not a big problem. However, you can spread it to other sites and they can be a problem. Mm -hmm. And here you see a woman who has rubbed her eye after uh, having been inoculated and she has a vaccinal infection of the eyelid. Now that shouldn't be a problem, but if it gets onto the cornea, it can be very serious and, uh, and that is not so good. We go on to uh, another one here. Now here is a situation with a child, I think this is a childhood leukemia, and uh, people who have a vaccine or immune deficiency disorder may have this very severe form of uh, vaccinia in which the organism keeps growing. It's called vaccinia necrosum. And this can often be fatal, and this is quite a serious matter to have that. For a vaccinia necrosum, you can use vaccinia immune globulin to treat it, but uh, it's not an, a pleasant disease. Are there certain people who shouldn't be vaccinated? Well, uh, Doris, as Dr. Henderson uh, alluded to, there is a condition called uh, eczema vaccinatum, uh, and that can occur in people who have eczema. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have a picture of that. Eczema uh, is... Uh, uh, a significant dermatologic disease in many patients, and eczema vaccinatum is a horrible condition uh, that is associated in cases uh, uh, with mortality. Uh, and so eczema was a relative contraindication to vaccination. I should point out, though, that um, 
you know, if you were truly exposed to smallpox, smallpox is a very deadly disease, and uh, you might still uh, consider immunizing or alternatively uh, giving vaccinia immune globulin to those patients. Uh, one of the worst side effects was seen in immunocompromised individuals, and we just saw the picture of a, of a leukemic child who right. was inadvertently vaccinated. Uh, in this day and age, with the advent uh, of modern intensive care, bone marrow transplantation, and the HIV epidemic, we see far more immunocompromised patients than we ever did before. And people with HIV or the these severe forms of immunosuppression uh, probably should not be vaccinated even if they get exposed to smallpox and that's going to be a judgment call but the alternative for an HIV patient for example would be to just give them vaccinia immune globulin instead of immunization uh, there's an issue though with pregnant women um, and I believe we have a picture uh, of a fetus who died of fetal vaccinia uh, when his mother was uh, uh, vaccinated during the days of smallpox immunization. Now, this brings up a, a kind of a tough conundrum for us. Um, again, smallpox is a very deadly disease. Smallpox is deadly to the fetus if the mother gets smallpox as well. And so, pregnancy is not an absolute contraindication of vaccination. If you get exposed to bona fide smallpox and you're pregnant, you probably should still be vaccinated. This really isn't uh, that common a condition, but it's a condition clinicians should be aware of. Okay. Well, Dr. Henderson, then it sounds like the vaccine can be kind of dangerous to use. Yes, I think in showing these pictures, I think this has emphasized too much uh, the reactions to the vaccine when, in fact, serious reactions to the vaccine were not all that, un that common. Uh, one in 500,000 was what, uh, the number that would have a serious reaction. It isn't to say that they wouldn't have some lesions on another part of the body. That was not serious. But serious reactions, one in 500,000, and that's not a very high number. We'd like to have none. But no vaccine is totally safe. Every vaccine we have protects, and you, you want that protection. It also has some risk, and you're weighing benefit and risk all the time. As one looks at it, I think, uh, Ted, as you've said, uh, if you're faced with a situation where you're exposed to smallpox, uh, what contraindications are there? And I know uh, during the global program on smallpox eradication, we considered this very carefully, and we finally said, you know, smallpox is so dangerous compared to vaccination that the only contraindication that would, would be appropriate would be that if the individual looked like he might die the following day, then you won't vaccinate him because mm -hmm. he might be wrongly blame the vaccination for the death. So that I think uh, this is, I think, puts it into perspective as to just how important the vaccination is under the terms of, terms of a threat. Okay. What is vaccinia immune globulin? Well, Doris, uh, vaccinia immune globulin, or VIG, uh, is a way to provide passive immunity uh, to people exposed to variola. But I want to emphasize that uh, VIG is really designed to treat the complications of vaccination more than it is to be a treatment for variola. Uh, the U.S. Army maintains a modest supply of vaccinia immune globulin, and it can be used uh, for those eczema patients and pregnant women uh, and severely immunocompromised patients. Okay, what about public health measures? I mean, wouldn't cases of smallpox be an emergency situation? Uh, we always regard smallpox as ab an absolute international emergency because if smallpox really is out in the community, the potential for spread across the world is there. And so that to regard this as a, an absolute emergency is key. Now, just how uh, smallpox might spread and the potential of smallpox as an aerosol became apparent to us in 1970. And that year, there was a, an electrician, a German electrician, working in Pakistan who came back to a town of Mesheda in Germany. Uh, he had some uh, diarrhea. He had a fever. Uh, they thought he had typhoid fever. And so they decided to isolate him. They isolated him in one room of the hospital and were able to verify that, in fact, there were only two nursing sisters who saw that patient. Uh, they vaccinated uh, everybody in the hospital or gave them vaccine immune globulin. They vaccinated 100,000 people in the, in the town. They, uh, they quarantined the hospital so nobody would leave. And what happened? Well, let us see the next picture. I think this is, uh, this is the picture, actually, of the German electrician. Now, he developed smallpox three days after he was admitted into the hospital. Uh, he was immediately evacuated to a German smallpox hospital. Yes, they had special smallpox hospitals in Germany and in Britain, which were kept 
fully uh, equipped to be opened only if smallpox was introduced into the countries. I think it's an illustration of how much the countries worried about smallpox. So he's only in that hospital a very short time. Now what happened? Can we see the next uh, slide here? You see the green bit uh, three days or uh, four days where he exposed, possibly could have exposed uh, others. And you see this big wave of cases, uh, some uh, I think it's 17 cases that occurred. And those cases occurred in rooms adjacent to his. They occurred in rooms on the second floor of the hospital. He was on the ground floor. There were some of those cases which occurred on the third floor of the hospital. There was one case in a visitor who had, can't come to the door of a long corridor, opened it way, the patient's room was way at the other end, opened the door, asked for directions, closed it again, and uh, 11 days later, he had smallpox. Now, what was, what was strange about this? What was strange was that the patient had cough. And with smallpox, we rarely saw cough. Uh, we suspect he may have had a complicating influenza at the time. And there's nothing that's going to produce an aerosol quite so effectively as cough. Wow. Uh, so that we fi figure in this case that this was an aerosol of smallpox which covered three floors of a hospital spread from that patient. And I think it illustrates uh, what uh, the potential of smallpox in an aerosol to spread, to infect, uh, to really cause a lot of trouble. And bear in mind, those people in the hospital, most all of them had already been vaccinated in childhood, mm -hmm. and now they're older, and they came down with the disease, and some died. So there is some real cause to be concerned uh, with an individual in that situation. This is a scary disease. That's right. You know, Doris, I think every parent out there is familiar with the fact that if your child has chicken pox, uh, and their lesions become scabbed over, mm -hmm. it's safe to go back to daycare, back to school, or wherever. Mm -hmm. It's important to remember, though, that in the case of smallpox, patients are infectious to others from the time of onset of the exanthem until the scars are complete, or the scabs uh, are completely healed, until mm -hmm. the scabs have fallen off, uh, if you will. So very different uh, in that sense from chickenpox. Infectivity, uh, as Dr. Henderson uh, stated, is enhanced uh, in the presence of a cough. Uh, contamination via contaminated bedding or other fomites uh, really is not an important way of transmission, only occurs uh, fairly infrequently. Okay, is there anything else we need to know about decontamination? Well, just that all objects in contact with the patient, the linens, the clothing, uh, the ambulance and its surfaces, uh, etc., require disinfection, and that would best be accomplished by uh, sodium hypochlorite solution, by steam, uh, or by fire. Uh, the regular decon of soldiers after exposure to an aerosol remains the same uh, as it would be for most other agents, bleach or soap and water as a field expedient. Uh, if you don't know that personnel have been uh, exposed until after the first patient uh, arrive, uh, it's been long enough by then, um, in fact, 12-day incubation period has mm -hmm. been more than long enough, uh, so that decon of the unit at that point wouldn't accomplish anything. You need to remember, again, the incubation period for smallpox is much longer than with many of the agents we talked about yesterday, for example. Okay, is there a treatment for patients who have the disease? Well, Doris, uh, besides supportive care, there's really no specific treatment uh, at this time. USAMRED uh, is working on some new pox viral uh, therapeutics now, uh, and there have been some good results seen with a specific antiviral drug, uh, sidofovir. All right. Dr. John Huggins from USAMRED is the primary researcher on the uh, Sidofovir Sidofavir. <laughs> thank you, yeah. uh, trials. Thank Let's you. hear from him uh, what his preliminary results are. When we recognized that smallpox was perhaps a disease that we were not quite as ready for as we ought to be, we asked ourselves what were the vulnerabilities, and clearly therapy for smallpox was, was a vulnerability that the U.S. had. And so we asked a question, what potential therapies would there be for that? And one of the things that we noticed is that the, the enzyme that replicates smallpox is essentially the same enzyme that replicates herpes viruses, and because of that, a whole class of drugs developed against the various herpes viruses had a potential to work against smallpox. So we went to the CDC and tested these drugs against smallpox, and found that cytofavir, a class of compounds that are licensed for CMV retinitis, also inhibited smallpox virus, a virus that's difficult to work with and particularly do animal studies, but also monkeypox and cowpox and other viruses that we have animal models that we could really test a drug to see if it would work. And using those models, we've been able to 
determined that, in fact, cytofovir does work, and we're continuing to aerosol infect animals to simulate a smallpox infection, and we can, in fact, treat those animals. We're trying to determine at the moment how late an infection we can treat, but it looks very encouraging for us. Certainly, in the incubation period, it looks like that it's going to be very effective. We can prophylax animals that we're going to infect, and we can treat animals at the moment 24 hours after we infect them, and whereas the control animals develop a bronchopneumonia, much like pa patients with, with monkeypox do and like smallpox, fatal smallpox cases do, a control animal will develop fatal bronchopneumonia and die with, say, pulse oximetry values down around 50, whereas the drug-treated animals never fall below 90 and are essentially asymptomatic during the entire treatment period. So it looks like we've got more work to do, but it does look like this drug has good, good potential to work against smallpox. I think that clearly since smallpox has been, there is no naturally occurring smallpox, we're never going to be able to do the classical two drug efficacy trials that the FDA normally re requires. We are going to where monkeypox exists and it has become a re-emerging disease in the, the old Zaire and we're going to look to see if in fact there are enough cases there that we can do a clinical trial. But like a lot of other biowarfare agents, we're probably never going to know truly that it works against smallpox until we actually have to use the drug. Luckily, there is very little difference between smallpox and monkeypox, both in the virus and in the way that, say, monkeypox infects monkeys. So I think we've got very good surrogate models, and we can treat monkeys, and we can measure the same things that a normal patient would, would measure. So I think we're going to come very close, although we're clearly never going to know that it works against smallpox until there's actually a biological incident. First, I just want to clarify uh, something for the studio audience. Uh, you know, Dr. Huggins works at USAMRID, and I bet there are people out there saying, hey, uh, I thought there was only smallpox at CDC and at Colt Sova. How's this guy working with smallpox? Just wanted to reassure people that uh, he did that smallpox research at the CDC and not at USAMRID. All right. Well, Dr. Henderson, um, I think we ought to... Now, I think this drug right. that he's talking about certainly sounds pretty promising to me. I don't know if you have any take on that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, as we've looked at it, it does look very promising, but I think from the stage where it is now till its actual use in humans, there's a lot of work to be done yet. And I don't think we, uh, we want to be too optimistic too early because we don't have very much of the drug. Yeah. There's a lot of testing to be done yet. All right. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And now it's time to move on to Venezuelan equine encephalitis, or V, and we'll be right back with our next guest.